Jess Piper was an American literature teacher for 16 years before deciding to take the plunge and run for office. She ran for a Missouri State House seat in a deeply red district. And while she didn't win, she continues to advance her activism as executive director of Blue Missouri and hosts a weekly, weekly podcast called Dirt Road Democrat. I've been reading her essays at The View from Rural Missouri for a while now, but I was amazed by how much one of her recent posts, uh, one of her recent pieces, really resonated with so many people. Because you may remember that after President Biden delivered the State of the Union, the Republicans tapped Alabama Senator Katie Britt to deliver the response. It was not great. Uh, it was memorable for all the wrong reasons. It screamed high school theater kid. It was so bad that Scarlett Johansson imitated her on Saturday Night Live. But Jess Piper saw something different, something religious, and that's why I wanted to talk to her. Let me bring her in here. Hi, Jess. How are you doing? Hi, I'm doing well. How are you? Excellent. I gave a brief introduction, but can you tell everyone a little bit more about uh, who you are, what you do before we get into all the fun, funny baby stuff? <laughs> sure. So you have summoned a woman from the cornfields and the bean fields of Northwest Missouri uh, to speak today. Um, my name is Jess Piper. I was a literature teacher for 16 years. And um, in 2018, Missouri uh, passed a, a, an abortion ban, which got me uh, way more politically active. And in 2020, I went to vote and there was no Democratic uh, person running for state rep on my on my ballot. So I decided if no one else was going to do it, I did it. And in the state of Missouri, you can't be a teacher and run for office. So um, I had to choose and um, I chose and I lost. But uh, that was kind of predictable. I live in a place that hasn't elected a Democrat in 32 years. But anyway, can you uh, go back for a second and tell me I've never heard that rule that you can't be a teacher and run for office. Is that specific to teachers or is that you can't have any other job? Teachers, specific to teachers, which is really weird, right? I mean, you've got 66,000 really well-educated folks in the state who cannot run for office unless they want to leave their career. Um, and so I think it's purposeful, obviously, but yeah. And now you're little... running an organization called Blue Missouri? Yes. Now I work with uh, Blue Missouri and we support down ballot candidates um, who normally don't get support from the state party. Um, we like to say that we fill in the gap because, you know, uh, in general, state parties need to focus on a few races that they hope can flip. And my thing is, hey, there's still 163, you know, um, seats across the house that have no funding and, and no one helping them. So we fill in that gap. Well, excellent. Well, let's talk about uh, this. Uh, a speech that Katie Britt gave first. And we'll, I have a bunch of clips lined up that I, I think people will enjoy, but let me play a small portion of Katie Britt's State of the Union response, and then we could talk about what you heard uh, from that. First of all, we see you, we hear you, and we stand with you. Our future starts around kitchen tables just like this, with moms and dads just like you. And you are why I believe with every fiber of my being that despite the current state of our union, our best days are still ahead. <laughs> okay, so what did you notice about her speech when you heard it? Well, I didn't plan to listen to it. Um, and I was I was heading out of the living room and it came on and I jerked my head around and I looked at the TV and I was like, oh, I know who Katie Britt is. I actually didn't know who she was, but as soon as I heard that voice, I did. Let me start off by saying that I'm not trying to, um, you know, this is sort of feels like patriarchy to attack a woman for the way her voice sounds. This is not what Katie Britt sounds like. This is what she sounded like for the audience that evening. In general, she sounds like I do. She sounds like, you know, a woman who is a senator. Yeah. You know, what was interesting is someone played a clip that she put out. I mean, she put out a clip on her social media, maybe 10 or 15 minutes before her speech began 
sounded totally fine, innocuous. I never would have, uh, no one would be making fun of it if she talked like normal, how she normally does. But she went into a different vocal pattern when she gave that delivery. Right. And and I call it fundy va uh, baby voice, but I, the fundy part came later. Later, I was born and raised in the fundamentalist church, a Southern Baptist, and we always called it the baby voice. It's what women would do when they were needing to sound submissive, needing to sound like they were going to obey, needing to sound like, you know, they were true Christian women. They would um, slip back into this high pitched, childlike, breathy voice. Um, and you heard it there and, um, the really long pauses and, uh, the way she does sound like child and the way she, you know, the, it's the voice, it's the fundy ba baby voice. So fundy is a snarky term for fundamentalist. Sure. <laughs> so we yeah. added, we added that later, but, um, I know you have some other clips, but when you hear that and when you were born and raised into a religion like I was, it's immediately I knew who she was speaking to. And it, it wasn't to you and it wasn't to me. And who was she speaking to? Was she speaking to other Christian moms like her? Yeah, she's it's part of the Christian nationalist movement. It's um, women being submissive and being in their place, which is hard for Katie because she is a senator. So she had to pull herself back to be able to speak like that. She started off by talking about the fact that she's a mother. So she's like, you know, I may be in a position of power, but actually I'm just a mom. And actually I'm going to talk about my husband and I'm going to mention him by name and talk about the fact that, you know, we hold hands and, and we pray for the rest of you. Right. And yet they, uh, the image behind her, of course, is a kitchen, which I don't think that was lost on many people either. It wasn't the cross. Everything in there was, you know, iconic, traditional wife or trad wife, um, you know, fundamentalist. And she was speaking um, to those people specifically. And when you go into that sort of voice, and again, this is not something you were taught. It's something you pick up on when you're in the culture. What message is it sending besides just, yes, I'm submissive. I'm not threatening what is the intent for the listener when they kind of go into that pattern? When I heard it all the time, it, it was usually with someone who I thought was, you know, better than me. Um, they were a better wife. They were a better woman. They were a better person in general because they knew their place um, and they were showing you their place by speaking, you know, in, in that voice. Um, and so it always felt to me it was always a little off putting because it was it was meant to f make you feel like, you know, not as good as they are. I is, know that's weird. <laughs> is there a male equivalent of that? Well, there's the preacher voice. You know, I have to tell you, I was watching HGTV yesterday and um, I was watching where people, you know, were buying a beach house and it's their second house. And these people had four hundred thousand dollars for their second house. And I was watching it and I was like, I told my husband, I said, he's a preacher. And he listened. He was like, yep, he's a preacher. They never said what he did for a living. And finally, he was he he did a really bad job on nailing in a piece of wood. And he said, I think I'll stick to preaching. And I was like, ah, I knew it. I knew it because they sound a certain way too. They sound um, congenial. They are jovial. They are easily approachable. And they have um, a speech pattern that is almost childlike as well, right? They call each other sister and brother. I mean, it's meant to be, you know, this um, family-like, um, almost childlike experience. I think you had written something. I think this is your quotation I'm reading here. When you heard the Brit voice there. She was also harboring secrets. And that's something I can't forget. Terrible secrets behind that voice. Because the thing about what you wrote in your essay and what I've seen from others is that it's not just a voice you do when you're trying to get someone to trust you and you're trying to talk down to someone else. It's a voice you use when you're angry. <laughs> it's a voice you do when you're trying to keep people off the scent mm -hmm. sometimes. Like what else have when have you come across this uh in your life besides prominent figures but in your life wh who's using it so i remember a specific example when um my oldest son who's now 28 when he was in uh preschool and he went to to the baptist preschool um and i went to pick him up one day and his teacher came out and she said um, I have to tell you what Spencer told me today. And I was like, oh God, like, there's no telling what this kid has said. 
She said, I asked him, what's your mama been up to? And he said, smoking stogies on the back porch. <laughs> and so I, I was a closet smoker and I thought he was asleep and I would step out and, you know, on the back porch. She came out with this baby voice to tell me that she knew something about me and that I was not as good as she was. Right. But um, so, you know, we encounter it when someone is admonishing us for doing something that we shouldn't be doing. 